today, I want to honor the fathers, and uh, usually what I do, that uh, I rip their hearts out on Father's Day, <laughs> and they always say, when are you going to preach something nice about us? So today's your day, and uh, I'm going to be nice and sweet, and uh, it's going to be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Title of my message this morning is, Men, Fathers, You're Special. Amen? You're special, and uh, you really are. There's really an absence of fathers going on across our country today, and I got some statistics I thought were interesting. Without a father in the home, four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become a pregnant teen, more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to go to prison, more likely to suffer obesity, more likely to commit crime, and two times more likely to drop out of high school. I thought that was interesting. 72% of Americans think an absent father in the household is the most important problem facing American families today. That was from a poll. And uh, I just heard two black fellows that I really respect, uh, Larry Elder and Bob Woodson, and they, they said also that's the number one problem uh, in the black community, but I believe it's also one of the great problems in the white and Hispanic community, that's for sure. 71% of all high school dropouts are from fatherless households. Teenage repeat offenders, arsonists, is 90% more likely to be from an absent father household. The percentage of minors in prison who grew up without a father is 85%. That's amazing. Preschoolers with an involved father figure develop better verbal skills. You can tell I didn't have a father in my home. <laughs> And that's the truth, okay? And uh, let me see, I think there's another one here. The percentage of adolescents in substance abuse treatment facilities who are from fatherless homes is 75%. 71% of teenagers who are pregnant come from a fatherless home. 63% of youth suicides happens in households with an absent father. And 85% of children with behavioral disorders are from homes without fathers. And so that just tells us that we need fathers in the homes. Fathers are very, very important, even though our culture is trying to minimize uh, the father and even feminize the fathers today. Within our culture that's going downward spiral, our leaders and legislators, they're looking everywhere for answers. And usually, most often, it's in the wrong places. Uh, it seems like they no longer take into account God, faith, redemption, forgiveness, the gospel of grace. They don't take those things in consideration when they're trying to think, how can we help this person? They're beginning to exclude that. I was watching the news the other night, and uh, this fellow producing this documentary, and uh, he was on with uh, Bob Woodson, and it, it was real interesting, and he had uh, stories of three black Hispanic former gang members, and they had no fathers involved in their lives at all, and it wasn't long they became part of gangs, and then they went to prison, but thank God in prison, they got redeemed. They put their faith in Christ, their sins were forgiven, and they changed. And they were, went back home after their time, and they're working in the community to try to help other kids who don't have fathers. And it's an amazing story. It just rips your heart out and everything. And the one fellow said this. I thought it was excellent. He said, without a father being involved in his life, the streets became my father. And uh, that's what the documentary is all about. And so 
uh, that will be coming when you see that uh, advertised. You need to, need to watch that. Man was created first. And that gives him the privilege and responsibility and uh, that only the man can fulfill God's given plans for man. Now, we admit right up front, we can't make this life without our women, <laughs> without our ladies. We understand that. This message is not about ladies and their goodness and kindness and everything. This is about God getting a hold and getting a hold of men. That's important. In Genesis 2, God created marriage and appointed a man to be the home's pastor, the priest, the responsible one, to be the home's leader. He appointed man to do that. We see in Genesis 6 that the world became dark and was very wicked, and God had to destroy it by a universal flood. But prior to the flood, he reached down and in grace... He chose a man by the name of Noah to save mankind's seed. And man became the foreman. <laughs> and he built the ark so that the seed of mankind could continue living on. We know then in Genesis 9 and 10, the world remained sinful again. They were of one language. They were creating idols they were uh, building the Tower of Babel, making their own God. And so God, in mercy, reached down and confounded their language into languages. And he scattered them. And they were to do that and before he ever did that, but they were not obedient. And uh, so he scatters the people there. But the people, they continue to remain sinful and corrupt. And the whole world, once again, there's hardly anybody or a nation that worshiped the only true God, Jehovah, which we know Jehovah is Jesus Christ. And God, though, in mercy, in Genesis 12, reached down in grace and called out a man to start an entire new nation, a nation that would love God, appreciate him, and worship God. And that nation is Israel, but that man was Abraham. Now, let me just give you a little. A lot of people criticize Israel. They're in the land that wasn't theirs. Well, you can say that about any nation in the world. They weren't there at first. And uh, so I think it's important that you see something that God said. Genesis 15, verse 13 and following says this. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. In other words, they're going to occupy a land of people that's there, but that land is not those people's. And shall serve them, and shall afflict them 400 years. He's going to a land, and that land would be Egypt, right? That's not theirs. And also that nation whom they shall serve, Egypt, will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. substance. And then, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Now get this. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, there's people in the land that I'm going to give you, take you out of Egypt, and I'm going to give you this land. I'm allowing them to build up their sin. They come up until that cup is full, and then I'm going to remove them. And as I was looking at that, I wonder how full our cup is in America uh, of how God, how God is put up with us all this time. I believe it's overflowing because of God's grace and mercy. But you see that. And then the man himself, Abraham, chapter 18, verse 18. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that, that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now get this, for I know him that he will command his children and his household 
after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring up on Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. The reason God chose Abraham, because he was a man of God. He would become a great man of God in a sense. And he would follow the ways of the Lord. That's Abraham. That's the man God called out. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons who would actually lead the 12 tribes later on. All are men, all are leaders of their homes, of their tribes, and of their nation. God puts a premium upon men. But first, before Israel, the Hebrews and the Jews, because of famine, they were in Egypt. And in Egypt, they had become slaves. The Egyptians had become taskmasters. And for 400 years, that was going on, and they needed a deliverer. And God reached down, and he chose a man. And that man was who? Moses. And Moses led out of Egypt the Jewish people. In the wilderness there, before they got to Israel... Moses needed help to administrate. And so they looked out among, and the people chose 70 men. Why? Men are to be leaders. Men are to lead the way, help guide the way for those who follow them, their families, the nation, whatever. When Moses died, Israel needed a leader. They needed the leader to take them into the promised land. Moses couldn't go in because he had sinned. And God reached down and chose a man, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua is the one who led him across Jordan into the promised land, defeated the enemies whose sin had filled up by then, and removed them from the land so Israel could have a land. Later, Israel wanted someone to be their king. They didn't want God to rule over them. They wanted a king like the other nations. And Israel chose a man by the name of Saul. He became King Saul, didn't he? But prior to him becoming king, secretly, God had his prophet Samuel pick out a lad from the, tri or from the family of Jesse and anointed a young man by the name of David, and David would one day, that man, become king of Israel. The temple's construction, it was Israel, it was uh, David's idea, but God said, I'm not going to allow you because of what has happened in the past. But David's son, a man, he helped build the temple and then completed and finished that temple. He was the man, the king, whose name was Solomon, okay? God honored a man. Later, Israel sinned. They went into spiritual idolatry and adultery, and God sent them into captivity. In Israel's captivity, to give them hope, God appointed men, prophets, to declare his word. Men like Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the minor prophets of God. And he anointed them to minister to the people of Israel. Later, to announce Christ's entrance into this world, God in flesh, to introduce the Messiah, God chose a man to be the proclaimer the one who would identify who the Messiah truly was. And his name was John the Baptist, the forerunner. It's amazing how God works through men, man. And then not only that, during Christ's earthly ministry, Jesus chose 12 men to be his disciples. And they became men apostles. We know that Israel's religious leaders, apostate, they rejected the Messiah and they crucified him, murdered him upon an old cross. 
after his resurrection and his ascension then to be a leader in that messianic kingdom church, they looked out and chose men to be servants, somewhat like deacons in Acts chapter 6. But the Israel leaders once again rejected that kingdom offer, didn't they? As a result of that, there was no hope not only for Israel individually, but also for the world. But God, in his grace and his mercy, reached down and he saved and called one man to be the apostle to the Gentiles, the man Saul of Tarsus. Saul was saved in Acts 9. Later on, he became the apostle Paul. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Gentile name in a sense. A great representative of Jew and Gentile in one body of the grace of God. And Paul was appointed, anointed by Christ to tell Christ's words about body truths. Let me say something. Because we honor Paul, in a sense because he's our apostle. He's the apostle to the body of Christ, the local church today. And he's our apostle. The 12 are not our apostles. Paul is our apostle. And he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. And because we follow Paul, there are those who think that we're putting Paul above Jesus Christ. Let me say, never think that. That's a devil's lie. Jesus Christ is our head. Nobody can match Jesus Christ. Nobody. And so he's not, Paul is not greater than Christ, but Paul is his instrument, just like when he called Moses, Paul is his instrument for the body of Christ. And Paul relays the message, the words of Christ to that body. That's the apostle Paul that we respect so much when we read the scriptures. Then also the first Missionary team sent out from Antioch were a team of men, Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13 there. Today, those who proclaim the word of God are pastors, evangelists, and they are men. The Bible states this, if a man desires the office of a bishop, an elder, a pastor, the husband, that's a man, of one wife. That's his qualification. The church at Corinth, they were having problems about spiritual gifts and things. And Paul tells the ladies there, listen, if it's a controversial question to create problems in the church, what you need to do is be silent and you need to go home and ask your husband a man that will be the leader and tell you what the truth is. There's the Trinity. The Trinity is always in the masculine gender. Always. It says he, him, his. He even calls him, he's a man of war. <laughs> it states of Christ or of the Trinity. And then angels, when they appear in Scripture, we see in the bookstores and in other places, angels are usually, almost always, not always, but almost always women. But in the Bible, because angels are in leadership positions there, they're always portrayed as males. You don't find female angels in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? So if you call your wife an angel... She has to be a fallen angel. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, the authors of the Bible, the writers of the Bible, wrote 66 books, combined them in one. We call it the Bible. It was written by 40 men, inspired of God, the words to be inspired. Now, we know our women are highly valued and honored in the Scripture. 
But God has given men leadership responsibilities to fulfill. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so God says, I've chosen men to be leaders. Women have other responsibilities. But as far as the leadership responsibility, God holds that man accountable. As a believing man, God wants me and all you men to stand up and be godly men. Stand up, be faithful to God and his role for you. And the role that God wants you to fulfill is to be like Jesus. It's just that simple. Romans 8, 29 says this, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, now get this, to be conformed to the image of his Son. And that's our life journey, fellas, is to become more and more and more and more like Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. 2 Corinthians 4.11, for which we live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Now get this, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. It's about Christ. And his life in us that we might look like Jesus every now and then. Amen. Romans 6, 4, and 5. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. That spiritual baptism places us in the body of Christ. Into his death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together In the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. He says, I want you to take up your identity that you have in Christ. You have died with him when you believed in him. You have been buried with him and you have been raised with him. Now, identify with that truth. God wants us to be like Christ. When you think about Jesus Christ... Think about his constitution, his makeup, his character. He was always hearing from other people, he's illegitimate. They didn't understand the virgin birth. And they tried to shame Mary. They tried to shame Christ, all that. But he stood, so he was strong inwardly, his constitution, his carpentry. He had to have powerful forearms. They didn't have all the machinery that we have today. And so he had to do a lot of work. We know he had strong forearms. And then his calves. If you've ever been to Israel, you know what I mean. He walked mile after mile, hills, mountains, always rocky. No doubt he had great muscles in his legs just from walking all this, these miles. And then his conversation. They said no one ever spoke like this man. He speaks with power and authority. (laughs) And that's spiritually, but even physically, wherever he went, everybody could hear him. So he wasn't some mamsy, whamsy, pamsy. He let it out so everybody could hear him. And so uh, he was a man's man in that sense. And then his confrontations. He sometimes, he wouldn't get involved, but sometimes when he thought it necessary, he got involved. When he went into the temple, he turned over the money changers' tables, and uh, they about had a fit. He'd say to the Pharisees, woe unto you, you hypocrites, you vipers. I mean, Christ didn't hold back when he needed to say something. And then his convictions. Jesus Christ never compromised truth for convenience. 
He always stood. Even when they come, came to arrest him, they said, we're looking for Jesus Christ. He said, I am. And they stepped back and kneeled down <laughs> at first. He is the great I am. And then the convictions, the compassion. Jesus Christ, he was often moved. At times he wept over Jerusalem at Lazarus' grave when he saw the multitude in need and he touched many and healed them. He honored the lady. He was moved by the lady who washed his feet with her tears and then dried his feet with her hair. She was anointing his feet with oil and perfume and stuff too because she understood what the disciples didn't get a hold of. He was going to the cross and she was doing it for his birth. He was moved often. And then also his cross. You know, it's a curse to hang up on a cross according to the Jewish word. But on the cross, he took our sin, his condemnation, his trials, his beatings, his scourging. He was marred. Isaiah says he was unrecognizable when they got done with him. But he stood the test. And then you think of his conquering. You know, they buried him. He died on the cross, they buried him. But he conquered even the chains of death. And he arose victoriously. The conqueror. And then his calling. Jesus Christ, I should say his coming. You know, everybody's looking for his glory one day in a kingdom on the earth, when in reality we'll be in heaven. <laughs> but beside that, we're looking prior to the kingdom. It's called the rapture, being caught up, looking unto that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the next event on the calendar. And then his calling. He's calling you to be like him. And what he's saying is, I want you to be a real man. It's time you start acting like a real man. Act like Christ. He was a real man. And we need to be like him. Now many of you men, I know you fought to do your best. You fought through some of your problems. You remained faithful in having God in your life, in your marriage, in your family, and raising of your children. At times, even though you failed, you got back up and you kept trying. And you're even here today. Now to me, and I believe with all my heart to God, you men... You are special. And God loves you and wants to use you. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Watch ye, stand, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Be like Jesus. Joshua said this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, yeah, we've had our difficulties. We've had our troubles, but we're marching on. Amen. We're moving on and we're going to stand for God's truth. Amen. That's what God had once for you. You can't do that, though, unless you're saved. Because you can't do it in your own strength. If you use the world's wisdom and your flesh and your thinking, you will be defeated. The only way a person can be like Christ is to get in Christ. Amen? <laughs> that means it's time for me to acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> I, that's me. Sometimes I say, chief, you ever do that? And I know that whatever I do on my own, it can't get me to heaven. 
There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, not one. So how do I get my sins forgiven and be able to go to heaven? Well, God loved you so much, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And his son was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life on an old rugged cross. He died there for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. And he died. And they buried him, taking all of our sins with him so that they would never appear again. And he took our sins away and the father accepted his sacrifice and he rose from the grave. He's alive. That's called the gospel. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ is enough. It's sufficient to wash away your sins, give you eternal life. But also, he seals you with the Holy Spirit inside your body. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now, I'm not alone. Now, I don't have to do things on my own. I have a helper, a comforter. <laughs> He's inside of me. And he helps me to see the scriptures that helps me, guides me in how I should act, walk, behave, my conduct. And in the process of time, it's a journey. You begin to realize you didn't need that sin in your life. You put it away. But you need this in your life, something God gives you from the word you need. And so the process, this journey, is us putting off the old and putting on the new. And the more of the new you put on you, the more you begin to look like Jesus in the way you behave. The more victory you start having in your life. I can testify that before I became a Christian, I was, I was I, the depths of sin, yes, but I was a nice guy. I had to be to attract Carol some way. <laughs> yeah. She says she's sorry now after 57 years. But anyway, but I didn't have God in my heart or life. And so you try to do right and you just can't do it. You get frustrated with what in the world is wrong with me? I didn't have the armor. I didn't have the presence of Almighty God in me in my corner. And so I do good and I fail. I do good and I fail. But there came a day and time that God saved my soul. And I put my faith in the finished work of Christ and that alone, nothing else. And from that point on, I began to sense God's presence when I would read the scripture, when these things, and God began to work in my heart and in my life. And I began to put off the old and put on the new. There's a real difference before Christ And after Christ, it's night and day. Amen. And that's for you too. What you need to do is acknowledge that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself, but you're going to believe that gospel today. It's not something you do. It's something you believe. You believe. That it's enough for you. Not just something you heard, but it's for you in your heart. When I heard the gospel, there's other people around. I was the only one who went forward. It was for me. And faith in my heart and salvation came. And it's been a wonderful journey. We've had our trials even after you get saved. But thank God he was with me every step of the way. And he'll be with you too. And we would beg you on Father's Day. Men, you need to stand up. But especially if you're not saved, don't leave this facility lost. Just believe in the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ as sufficient to save you. Let's bow our heads.
while you have your heads bowed right now, just right there in your heart, tell God right now, God, I believe. I know I can't say myself, but I believe Jesus, your son, died for my sins, was buried and rose again. And today, that alone, I'm going to believe it. I believe it in my heart. Just tell him right now, I believe. And with your heads bowed, is there anybody here who would say, Pastor, I just want you to know I believed. <laughs> I believed. Just raise your hand right now. I believe. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. God bless you. There are several. We say to you, Happy Father's Day. The greatest decision anybody ever makes is when they believe. Father, I just pray that you would work in our people's hearts and minds. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the gospel. Help us to be faithful. Thank you for the men here. May they have a great Father's Day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpindy.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.